Starfield has gotten its first major update and it brings with it a feature that caused a lot of debate before the release of this game. We know leading up to this game, there was that partnership with Bethesda and Starfield and AMD, which made a ton of sense because Xbox uses AMD. So they came out and they partnered with the PC side and had Starfield AMD GPUs and created that whole marketing campaign around the release of Starfield. And one of the things that wasn't there was DLSS for the NVIDIA GPUs. And people were wondering if this was on purpose, if it was ever going to come over as a feature. So much so that there was a mod right away, right after the game release, where you could actually pay the person who created it and get DLSS support with your NVIDIA GPUs. And it showed just a huge advantage in the overall performance of the game. Now, none of that matters anymore as DLSS support has come over to Starfield with this official update that again was launched September 13th, which was yesterday. And here are the other things that come with it. There's gonna be brightness and contrast controls, HDR calibration menu added, an FOV slider added. Again, the NVIDIA DLSS support for PC added. 32 by nine ultra wide monitor support for PC will be added. And then finally, an eat button for food. So all of those juicy sandwiches and potatoes and whatever food you find out there in the galaxy of Starfield, you're now just going to be able to hit a button and start eating it, which is super cool because you would have to go into your menu before and go into your inventory and then eat it and you would get a little bit of health. But now you're just going to be able to eat that stuff. And I'm sure we'll see people stacking up packs of sandwiches on their ship, going back and just eating it with the simple click of a button. So this is the major things coming to this update. There's also some other stuff here they do talk about. They say that they are working on the built-in mod support that will work across all platforms. And they say this is similar to what they've done with Skyrim and Fallout 4. So if you're on Xbox, if you're playing it on Xbox like I am, you will get all of the mod support, which is a great thing because that's going to be huge for just expanding this game out across all of the devices that it is on. So there's also a couple of other things here like performance and stability fixes. The Xbox Series X and S is getting improved stability related to installations as well as some other various stability and performance improvements. There's also some quests here that are being updated. There are some bugs in some quests that sometimes it stops you from going through. Maybe you have to reset your game and then you can finally advance and they're fixing all of those things here, I guess, until some more are found out and then they'll have to fix those as well. So there it is. Starfield is getting a brand new update or has gotten a brand new update, which is going to be bringing over that NVIDIA DLSS support for all of those people using the NVIDIA GPUs. Now, when it comes to Starfield and pushing the sales of the Xbox consoles, it has done a very, very good job. When it comes to first party exclusivity, it's obvious if you look at the numbers, uh, people still think that it's the first party games as the main reason why people go out and buy consoles, but it is actually a much smaller percentage compared to the other reasons people go out and buy consoles, whether that's just for getting AAA gaming for a much lower price than building a PC, being able to play with your friends in multiplayer games who have a console, just the ease of use plug and play style of thing, rather than again, setting up and building a PC. There's so many different reasons why people buy consoles, and the biggest thing isn't first party games. However, big first party games can definitely give a surge to the sales. And we are absolutely seeing this here with Starfield. But I think there's also another reason, which it means that it was a very good move by Xbox. And the other reason is the release of that one terabyte Xbox Series S, which is doing very well too. So this is a report here from Video Game Chronicles and, and GameIndustry.biz. They're taking the information from and they say, that the sales of Microsoft consoles were up 76% week on week for seven days ended on September 2nd, according to the data from the market research firm GFK, which was published on GameIndustry.biz. And one of the major things here, like I said, is the Series S one terabyte model that did release on September 1st, which accounted for 24% of the total Xbox series console sold in that week. So obviously Bethesda is a huge game. They're breaking numbers. They've broken their Skyrim numbers in terms of the amount of players in, at the beginning with the 6 million. Like they are just doing insane numbers and is also helping push forward the Xbox console. It will be crazy to see the final 
I guess, look after a couple of months as to just how well and how successful this launch was for Starfield. Probably going to be breaking records across Xbox for first party. And I think they actually already have, as it does say here, Starfield also appears to have broken Microsoft's record for the biggest launch day for an Xbox Game Studios title. So success all around. Bethesda, for Starfield, and for Xbox. And we will see how these consoles continue to sell. But the Xbox Series S, you sit back and you think about the strategy that they're going for with that low entry point gang to play games like Starfield Day 1 on Game Pass is an absolute no-brainer. People are going to go out there almost impulse buy this thing just to be able to get access to it if they don't have other means of playing the game or they don't want to use Xbox Cloud Gaming. And I've played the game on the Series S and it runs fine. Like It's a good experience on the Xbox Series S. You're not going to be disappointed jumping into Starfield on your Xbox Series S. And then again, that one terabyte is very enticing to get just the more storage, especially with the size of these games. Okay, let's jump over here. Let's talk about Xbox Game Pass Core. We had this announcement a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago, whenever they came out with the change of the branding, getting rid of Xbox Live Gold. Xbox Game Pass Core is now your option if you just want the lowest tier of Xbox Game Pass, paying the same amount as you were paying for Xbox Game Pass Gold. But now, instead of the monthly games, you're getting a curated list of awesome games i would say just by looking at the list that you're gonna get full access to so they previously announced this and there was 25 games they announced and now we have a new update because this thing actually launches tomorrow and there's going to be 36 games available to be able to be played on the xbox series x and s and xbox one here's what they said when we announced the xbox game pass core we shared that this membership will come with more than 25 high, high quality games from the xbox game pass library we're thrilled to share that there will be 36 games available to play on the Xbox Series X and S and Xbox One starting tomorrow. Now, here's the list. There's 36 games. I will name them all, but you have to keep in mind that this is the starting list. And what is actually pretty interesting about this and pretty cool is that they're going to be updating the Game Pass Core library two to three times a year. So if there's a game that you're playing, it may jump out, but I'm guessing that you're going to get discounts if you want to actually purchase that game and have it full price. Actually, it does say here that Game Pass Core will continue to provide the benefits you had with Xbox Live Gold, including the ability to play together with online console multiplayer, deals and discounts up to 50% off select games and access to free to play days for the select fully featured games. So up to 50% off select games, I would assume that they're going to put games that are going to be leaving the Game Pass Core service on sale for you to be able to purchase if you want to keep it. But here is the full list. Among Us, Astroneer, Celeste, Dead Cells, Descenders, Dishonored 2, Doom Eternal Standard Edition, Fable Anniversary, Fallout 4, Fallout 76, Firewatch, Forza Horizon 4 Standard Edition, Gang Beasts, Gears 5, Game of the Year Edition, Golf with Your Friends, Grounded, Halo 5 Guardians, Halo Wars 2, Hellblade, Senua's Sacrifice, Human Fall Flat, Inside Limbo, Ori in the Will of the Wisps, Overcooked 2, Payday 2, Crime Wave Edition, Power Wash Simulator, Psychonauts 2, Slay the Spire, Spirit Fairer Farewell Edition, Stardew Valley, State of Decay 2, Juggernaut Edition, Super Liminal, The Elder Scrolls Online, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Shredder's Revenge, Unpacking, and Vampire Survivors. So long list, mouthful. I tried to do that all in one breath. There it is. I think it's a great list. I think there are tons of good games here to play for somebody who just wants really the online access, which is essentially why you'd be signing up to Xbox Game Pass Core, because what's going to be happening here from the Xbox perspective, which I think is actually a very smart move for the investors side of thing and the reporting side of thing, is they're now going to be able to report everybody who was subscribed to Xbox Live Gold as a member of Xbox Game Pass because they will just be transferring those people over to Game Pass Core. And we're going to see an announcement, I'm guessing, sometime in the future with the Game Pass subscriber numbers absolutely skyrocketed past that 25 billion because they're now going to be able to include all of these guys. And this is exactly what PlayStation Plus does with the PlayStation Plus Essential, which is just the people that were previously subscribed to the $5 a month original PlayStation Plus subscribers, which gave you the online access. Now, obviously the price of that has increased, but 
Xbox Game Pass Core, for those people who don't want full access to the entire subscription, maybe you only play certain games and they're, they all include the multiplayer stuff. This one is going to be for you. And again, a very good list and launches tomorrow. We'll see what people's experiences are with Xbox Game Pass Core. Now, let's talk about Square Enix and Final Fantasy 16 because the verdict is finally here. We've seen so much back and forth. People arguing whether the game has been successful. We've seen the marketing come out after release and trying to spin it that it was a successful launch and you had other people coming out and saying that because it was a console exclusive, kept to only the PlayStation 5, it definitely hurt the sales and the success of Final Fantasy 16. And now it's official. It has absolutely hurt Final Fantasy 16, keeping it on only the PlayStation 5 at launch as Square Enix has lost nearly 2 billion in market value since Final Fantasy 16's release. And that only happens if the release was not good enough. This says here that Square Enix stock has fallen 30% from its peak this year, wiping almost 2 billion off of the company's market value. The Japanese publisher share price reached its highest point this year in the days running up to Final Fantasy 16's release in June. So a lot of people anticipated this was going to be bigger than it was, and clearly that is not the case. They say the slump comes after sales of the PS5 game reportedly failed to meet the high end of the company's expectations, but it also follows the disappointing performance of other big budget releases like 2020's live service lot Marvel's Avengers. But this fall is all relating here to Final Fantasy 16, not going the way that Square Enix wanted it to go. And what is extremely interesting about all of this is that we saw just a number of months later, Phil Spencer walk out onto the stage with Square Enix, with the new CEO, and announce Final Fantasy XIV coming over to Xbox and announce that they are going to continue to try to bring over all of these Square Enix games to the Xbox platform, essentially the ones that they can, which in my mind says the ones that we don't have deals already in place for, and the ones that we don't get just an absolutely insane bag from PlayStation that it would, it would compensate for us not putting it on the Xbox platform. But clearly with Final Fantasy 16, I'm sure PlayStation gave them a huge bag just to essentially keep it off of Xbox at launch, and it didn't work. So I feel like if you, there's Square Enix is sitting in their boardroom now and rethinking their strategy going forward with console exclusivity. When it comes to Final Fantasy 7 Remake, that one has already been locked in We'll see if the first part one ever comes over to Xbox, but this for Square Enix, it has them definitely rethinking going forward, keeping out of Xbox at the launch of a major game like Final Fantasy. Because Final Fantasy is a mainstream game from them. People on Xbox would have absolutely played this game and it would have helped their sales and maybe got them closer to the sales target that they wanted. We also just recently heard that it's officially releasing on PC soon. So that's going to help with the sales of Final Fantasy 16, but I'm sure they would have rather avoided this $2 billion in, in market loss based off of the release of this game and some other failures that they have had. And then finally, another game coming over to PC that is a PlayStation 5 first party game. This isn't surprising. This is now the way of PlayStation and it's a good thing. This is a good thing no matter what PlayStation fanboys try to say or how they try to spin it. This is a good thing when PlayStation is putting their first party games on PC. There's a leak here that Horizon Forbidden West, the complete edition, which is going to be coming with the Burning Skies DLC, will be coming onto PC. Not surprising. And this is going to be for all of those future first party games. We'll see Spider Man 2 coming at some point. I think, as I've predicted on this channel many times, at some point in the near future, in the next number of years, we are going to start seeing PlayStation releasing their first party games day and date on PC at the same time as they do release it on PlayStation, especially as the rising costs for developing these games continue to happen. They're going to have to be able to make more money right at the launch and just releasing it on the PS5 isn't going to cut it. You put it out onto PC, they're going to have so many more people playing it. They have all of these test cases already that's out there in the market that Xbox has provided them with games like Starfield, games like Horizon and all the other first party games that they've released. All that stuff is just a no-brainer to release your game day and date on PC at the same time as you release it on your console and just keep it exclusive to your ecosystem. But if you haven't played Horizon, you don't have a PS5, but you want to check it out on PC, keep your eyes open because it will be coming. But I'm going to leave the video there, guys. If you did enjoy this video, make sure to hit that thumbs up. If you are new here, hit that subscribe, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.